were you instrumental in the formation of the company, or were you did you just uh, come in later as a writer? How did that work? I came in about a year after Valiant had started doing the superhero books. Okay. So, the, I actually um, had sent my my samples off to be an artist for Valiant, and I had gotten their address out of Magnus 12, which was the first appearance of Turok. And what happened was I sent that in, and I called in to follow up, and I happened to reach Jim Shooter directly. And he uh, was very polite, but he was explaining how they get thousands of submissions, and wasn't likely that that uh, you know that, that you know, things were going to happen. And and besides, he wouldn't necessarily be able to find my submission in the huge pile. And I said, well, I sent it in in a black nine by twelve envelope, on purpose. And he said, okay, I, it's the only one here that's a black nine by twelve. And he opened it up, and he said, oh, you're actually really good. You know, maybe we can talk. And so I ended up talking to them further about my background. My background was also in production, a lot of printing and design and graphic design. And this was in the early days of desktop publishing. And so I, I uh, ended up uh, saying, well, if you ever need anybody that has a strong Mac background, strong printing background, I'd love to work with you even in the office. And they said, hang on a second. And he put me on with Bob Layton. And to, to tell it a little quicker, uh, about a week later, I was in New York uh, doing an interview. They hired me, and two weeks after that, I was living in New York and working on Magnus 13, so the very next issue. Wow. What are some of the other Valiant comics you worked on? I believe you worked on Bloodshot, right? Well, I created Bloodshot, okay. and so I wrote the first uh, almost 40 issues of Bloodshot. I created it with Don Perlin. I wrote Bloodshot, I wrote Eternal Warrior, I wrote Solar Man of the Atom. Uh, over the years, I was involved with the company. I wrote Exo Man of War, um, aspects of Magnus. Uh, uh, we did stories that moved in and out of the Unity saga. And so I wrote something called Unity the Lost Chapter. I wrote Time Walker. And, uh, pretty much had my hand in everything because I was also the. I started off as production manager, but because of all the other things I could do, I ended up helping to ink books. And, uh, and then I ended up writing and drawing Bloodshot Zero, which was the origin. And uh, I moved from being a production manager to an editor, and within a year I was the executive editor and vice president of the company. And uh, so it was a very fast ride. And um, the uh, Bob Layton and I were uh, were essentially the you know the the editorial heads, and then uh, we we you know expanded that team over time and had more editors and assistants and so forth. Now, at the time, I mean, unfortunately, it crashed eventually, I think, 94. At the time that you came in, the sales must have been pretty healthy, right, I imagine. Well, when I got there, the sales were poor. Okay. They, uh, when I arrived, are, well, poor, relatively speaking. When I got there, they were ecstatic that they had sold 40,000 copies of Solar 10. The average sale was more like 20,000, 25,000 that we were getting. Um, but Bloodshot 1 did almost a million copies. Hardcore was, you know, six, seven hundred thousand copies. Turok One was 1.7 million. So I mean, it was, uh, you know, we, we had this meteoric rise um, that I, I was there for. I teased them and told them it was because I got there and they hired me. And suddenly our sales picked up. But the reality was that Unity really drove a lot of sales, and we were also at a time where collectability was something that was starting to really spark in the marketplace. Wizard was new, we were new, Image was new. How would you define what made your Valiant comics at the time different from, say, Marvel DC or even Image? We had the strongest continuity in the industry, in my opinion. The, uh, our characters interacted, our characters uh, were consistent, and so if literally if we had a character that broke an arm in, in one book, then the next time you saw him in another title that week or two weeks later, it was still broken. We were very conscious of it. Our books used time date stamps, so we would literally say things like November 17th, 1992, 5.35 p.m. And so we were very conscious that, well, Bloodshot can't be at Heathrow in England and also be in New York on the same day, same time. And, uh, uh, you know, when you start small, and we did, the, uh, when I got there, there were six titles. We grew to eight, literally the week I arrived. I helped um, send Archer and Armstrong one and Eternal One to the printer uh, right off the bat. When you start small like that, you can control it, you can guide it. Jim Shooter had a very strong vision of what he was doing. Barry Windsor Smith and Bob uh, were big parts of that. Uh, Jim left. I had already been working with Jim to... Uh, uh, to write Solar and Eternal Warrior, and I had submitted scripts and things and was getting his feedback and so on. So when he left, I inherited those books. And then I created Bloodshot 
after that. He had already laid groundwork for it with um, something called Rise Zero, which was our sort of roadmap for our books. Now, do you mind talking about Jim Shooter's departure from the company? Is that something you, you don't want to talk about? or? I, I, I will talk about it. Sure. Well, I mean, I guess I can start by saying, as an, he was what, the editor-in-chief, the publisher? Uh, he was editor-in-chief. Jim, okay. Jim, as I understand it, because realize, again, I came in about a year after they had started the superhero titles, but uh, Steve Mazarski and, and Jim Shooter uh, uh, started the company. They originally had made a bid to do, from what I understand, something called Marvel on Ice. They were actually going to go and, and do a a big uh, Madison Square Garden kind of ice show with Marvel characters and so on. And that went away, but somewhere along the way they decided that they would make a bid to actually buy Marvel. Okay. And, you know, there's, there's rumors and legends and myths about all these things, but, but my understanding was that essentially that they bid somewhere around $63 million and Ronald Perlman, uh, Perlman who was the Revlon guy, uh, bought it for like 64 or 65. Now, whether he had inside knowledge of what their bid was or not, I don't know. But they, but he ended up buying the company, and uh, Jim and Mazarski ended up uh, separately raising private capital through a venture capital company called Triumph, uh, and they raised three million dollars to start Voyager Communications, which became Valiant Comics. And uh, and initially they were doing things like uh, Super Mario Brothers. Nintendo, they were doing, basically taking the idea, let's take what's popular in pop culture and do comic books for children based on that. And they had some level of success with it, but ultimately the plan was always to do what Jim did best, which was, was superhero entertainment. And then eventually he, unfortunately, did depart the company. And then once he left, um, is that something you want to talk about? Or, oh, I was just going to say, do you, do you know the circumstances that led to him leaving? Did he, was it willing? Uh, Jim had a number of partners in, involved in the company, and they there were agendas on all sides, and, and unfortunately there was conflicting stories as to, to what really happened, but what I can speak about is the fact that when I, uh, I, I came in on June 2nd of 1992, which was my anniversary, and Jim was gone, and the, uh, his belongings were being packed up and taken out, and his assistant was leaving, and and uh, his friend who was our color, one of our lead colorists, our art director, was also leaving. And um, it was a very, it, to me it was very much a surprise. Um, and uh, we ended up, uh, I, I was determined as production manager to make sure that we didn't miss shipping books. Because to me I felt that would be a very weak signal to the, to the marketplace. And so I took it upon myself to uh, uh, to work with the colorists and to actually I ended up inking quite a few backgrounds and things and we pulled a couple of all-nighters and we got the books out and we, sh and we didn't miss a beat and uh, so that was important and then on the heels of that is when I was hired to, to write the books I, I actually had a conversation with Jim the night that he was let go and said you know what do you think they, they want me to write the uh, um, you know but, but I, I don't want you to feel that, that in any way I'm, I'm jumping in and taking advantage of, of your misfortune and he said you're a talented guy I want you to have success you were gonna write if I was there go with God good luck and that was kind of the extent of it so. uh, do you still keep in contact with Jim at all no unfortunately the I think those sentiments changed over the years so, but, uh, <laughs> all right uh, I guess we'll leave it at that um, He's definitely a divisive personality. I mean, I, I see a lot of great stuff that he's done, but also some stuff I don't agree with, but we'll just leave it at that. Um, now, okay, you said that you uh, created Bloodshot, but but Rye had come up before that, so were you... Uh, yeah, but I, right. but I, was, I had a hand in that, okay. but yes. I was going to ask about the design. Very unique. It's the Japanese flag, right, basically? Uh, well, right, right. You mean the red, red sure. spot? The white with the red spot. Right. Well, that, and they had, to, to be fair, when I say I created Bloodshot, it's, it's, it's much like anything else. They, if you're asked Walt Disney who created Mickey Mouse, he's going to tell you Walt Disney did. But Ubi Works had a huge hand in it, and, and other people did as well. With Bloodshot in particular, the, um, uh, Jim and Bob were working out the details of Rise Zero. They already had Rye. Rye was already a white pasty face guy with a red dot in the center of his chest. So I, I didn't come up with any of that. But what we did was we had a storyline. They wanted to do a cyborg initially. 
that they were going to call Cold Blood. And I pointed out that Paul Galassi and Doug Mensch had a Marvel character in Marvel Presents who was a cyborg called Cold Blood, and that, that, that they couldn't do that. And uh, I'm a computer geek, and I always was. So I was the guy they were asking, you know, what, what do you call these things? What would you do this? And it was nanotechnology they were talking about. And so I babbled on about, you know, it's like, well, it's nanites, and it's blah, blah, blah. And then when Jim left, I ended up editing Rise Zero. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I don't remember if I'm credited that way or not, but that, that's how it was. I, I, I worked with Bob directly on it. Um, it's all his script and he, him trying to figure out uh, exactly what he and, and Jim had planned and what he wanted to stick with and so on. And because of the nature of, um, of that also telling the origin of Bloodshot to some degree, I was an aspect of that. But when we actually created Bloodshot 1, from that point forward, that was all, all me creatively as a writer. But we had, uh, when, I, when I say many people are involved in these things, the Howard Simpson uh, did a design for the outfit. David Klistic came up with a name because he came in and he had uh, had, had a hangover and somebody said, uh, man, you're Bloodshot. And it's, like, and it's like, that's the name you guys want. And it's like, yeah, actually, it's pretty cool. And uh, they uh, and Don Perlin had done a design working with uh, with Jim Shooter the before uh, Jim left that actually was uh, something that shows a um, an early prototype look something with an unusual shaved pattern in the head and so forth. What a lot of people don't tend to mention is if you look at the silhouette, the shape of the figure, the outline of the figure. This is the figure from Rise Zero, okay. yep. which is also Punisher by Mike Zack in Marvel Universe. Okay, okay. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was one of those things that Jim had done the basic design based off of just using a figure. Jim can draw. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. Jim Shooter. Yeah, he, he drew. He, he, I don't think he was ever comfortable enough with his own drawing to go professional with it, but he could draw, okay. and, and he uh, and he understood storytelling implicitly and all these other things. But with that figure, he had done just kind of a template, just to use a figure, here's the shape of it, and this is the kind of thing, and start filling it up. And it just, it, it had such an iconic look that when we went silhouette with it, we, we, we kept it. But it is inspired by that original uh, drawing. My exact. My exact Punisher, yeah. Okay, now, you had done the first 39 issues of uh, Bloodshot. Eventually, you left uh, Valiant completely, correct? Yes, I was under contract for two years beyond my initial term, meaning I, I was there as, art, as uh, production manager and executive editor, and at a certain point, uh, Acclaim Entertainment bought the company. The, I didn't necessarily want to stay there, primarily because I was interested in learning film, and, and uh, the company, I, we'd had the success of, of, of our books, and... Uh, the company was willing to put me under contract as a writer. I could live anywhere I wanted. And I made the call to move my family to Southern California. And so we moved to San Diego, and, and I wrote for the next two years. Wow. And what kind of stuff did you write at that point? I continued to write Bloodshot for probably another year, okay. uh, year and a half. The, the industry was crashing. Uh, it it did, didn't crash until really more like 95, early 96. Sure. Uh, but because what what contributed to it, a lot of people don't necessarily remember or know, uh, they might not be old enough to know, is that that um, Marvel Comics bought their own distribution. They bought Heroes, and uh, you know they essentially bought a regional distributor to distribute international comic books, and that didn't go very well. It was a bad plan. But in doing that, they put major distributors out of business. Capital City ultimately kind of got absorbed into Diamond. But, you know, Andromeda Friendly Franks, all these companies, Second Genesis, which were real companies that I worked with in the in the 90s and, and 80s, went away when all this happened, basically leaving Diamond as, as an almost monopoly at, at that time. And uh, that just didn't help the industry.